Welcome to Dominican University of California and to the 2010 One Book, One Marin Award ce Celebration. And I'm assuming you've all had the chance to read this fantastic book, and what a great opportunity for us to welcome the author, Michael Shaben. I just wanted you to know that Dominican University was invited about four years ago with the first One Book, One Marin to be a partner to the libraries that host this program. And we were very, very happy to offer our auditorium in support of this great community project. So I would really like to introduce our leader, Gail Haar, the director of Marin County Libraries. Gail? Well, welcome. Welcome to the concluding evening of the fourth year of One Book, One Marin, and I think the turnout here tonight shows us how important reading and books are to our community. And I just read a study that said 74% of the people they mentioned the word library to said books. People think of, of libraries and books together, and that's a brand identity that, boy, a lot of marketers would like to have. Um, reading books um, provokes us to think about ourselves and our environment and our relationships. And then when we talk about those books, um, it adds richness and depth to that experience of reading. And One Book, One Marin has just blossomed here in Marin because of the unique collaboration we've built uh, with our bookstores, especially with Book Passage, with Dominican University of California and their library, the Alemany Library, and then all of our public libraries. Um, and there are a lot of us. There's San Rafael, San Anselmo, Sausalito, Mill Valley, Belvedere, Tiburon, Larkspur, and then the 10 branches of the Marin County Free Library. And each of us comes to the table with our own particular strengths. And I think the result is an unparalleled opportunity for Marin's book lovers to read and discuss and build community, which is the tagline for our program. And this year's selection was Michael Shabin's Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. And it's just energized us all with his extraordinary language, with the doors it opened to sharing and discussing, and the opportunities it gave us to do some special programming in our libraries around the book. And none of this could have happened without the support of both our community partners and the generous um, financial sponsors we have. And I'd like you to take just a minute to, to look at the list behind me, because the wide range of individuals and businesses and corporations who support us is astounding. Um, and now I know you really all want to hear Michael Shaven, so now I would like to turn the microphone over to a woman who really needs very little introduction, the president of Book Passage, which is the self-described fiercely independent bookstore in Corte Madeira, Elaine Petricelli. Uh, I, Gail is an amazing leader for this project, and uh, you can see that the love of literature in our libraries is what brings us all together. Tonight we have the two Michaels. First we have Michael Krasny, who will be interviewing Michael Shaben. Dr. Krasny is a professor of English at San Francisco State University, but most of us know him as the incredible host of Forum on KQED 8.5 on your FM dial. Uh, Every day I turn into that program, tune into that program, and I never know whether I'm going to get someone in the arts, someone in politics, someone in engineering, but I know I'm going to be fascinated. He's the author of many scholarly publications, as well as a very interesting memoir, Off Mike, in which he talks about not only his own life, but also some of the sometimes rather wild people he has interviewed over the years. He has interviewed people like Saul Bellow, President Jimmy Carter, Isabel Allende yesterday, uh, Newt Gingrich, Barbara Kingsolver, Archbishop Tutu, and Michael Shaben. I must tell you that when he interviews someone, books fly out of my bookstore and I think everyone's bookstore. He is very good for books. In the fall, his own new book, Spiritual Envy, an Agnostic's Quest, will be out, and I can't wait to read that one. Michael, of course, will be in conversation with our One Book, One Marin author, Michael Shaben. Uh, critics call Michael's work pitch perfect, dazzling, evocative, poignant, um, 
in my book group, we also called it Sexy. I remember when Mysteries of Pittsburgh was published way back in 1988. What I didn't know until recently, that he started that book as his master's thesis. So those of you who are in working on your master's here at Dominican, I expect you too to have a bestseller, not one of those boring master's theses that only your mother looks at. His book, The Wonder Boys, went on to become a film starring Michael Douglas as well as a bestseller. He's written uh, short stories, screenplays, including being part of the writing team for Spider-Man 2. You know this guy kind of likes cartoons. Uh, we, tonight in the reception, someone was saying that the Yiddish Policeman's Union was so amazing that as soon as it was finished, you had to start all over because you didn't want to leave his world. I could go on and on, but I do want to mention Manhood for Amateurs, the pleasures and regrets of a husband, father, and son. It is just about to come out in paperback. It is the perfect Father's Day or Mother's Day present. And if you are a parent or have ever had a parent, you will recognize people in that book. His third novel, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, was published in a very, not a very large print, uh, but everyone who read that book told someone who told someone who told someone who told someone. Because as those of you who've read it know, it is mesmerizing. It won the American Library Association's Notable Book for 2000, the New York Society Library Prize, the Barry of Book Reviewers Award, the Commonwealth Gold Medal, the Pulitzer Prize, and best of all, the One Book, One Marin Award. <laughs> so I am proud to introduce you to two authors I admire so much, Michael Krasny and Michael Shaben. Hey, Michael. Here we are, back together again, <laughs> two Michaels. Actually, um, I, I should say by way of introduction that I've long been admired of Michael Chabons, and uh, I'm pleased and honored to be here with him tonight. And in a book that I put out a few years ago, I have a section about him where I said that he at that time was, and still is to some degree, who I wanted to be, because I wanted <laughs> to be a novelist, and I wanted to be the kind of novelist that Michael is. So it's a real pleasure to be with him this evening. And I thought since Cavalier and Clay is the book, and it's being read by so many of you uh, who are here tonight, that we would talk about the origins and the genesis of Cavalier and Clay. I have a new Great. picture in my mind, by the way, of you down playing with toy soldiers after reading a recent article. It used to be you with comic books, and now it's toy soldiers. <laughs> but the play and the creativity that comes out of that book is, is wonderful. And the story itself, talk about the genesis of that story. Well, I was a, in, in, a regular and devoted reader of comic books when I was a kid, and my father uh, was the one who supplied me with them. He was my pusher. <laughs> and uh, it was a family tradition in the sense that his father had supplied him with comic books when he was a kid. Uh, my grandfather was a printer. He worked in a big printing press on the west side of New York City, um, I think on 11th Avenue, and uh, they printed all kinds of things, and his main thing at that time was movie posters. He pr did printing for the one sheets for theaters, but they also printed comic books at this plant, and they guess they had a lot of comic books lying around, and he would scoop them up every week and, or steal them. <laughs> it now occurs to me as I'm telling the story. Uh, and, uh, and bring them home for my dad. So, and then my, the way my dad tells the story is that he, he is a very meticulous, um, not to say obsessive, compulsive person. And he, I guess even as a boy, was very neat. So he would read these comics very carefully without opening them too much and keep them in perfect condition. And then he would take them down, because they were hot off the press, he would take them down to the candy store, as they called it, on the corner uh, in Brooklyn where he lived and trade them to the owner for 
the ones that his, grand, that his father hadn't brought him home. So he thought reading comic books was a very important part of uh, childhood education. And uh, because of all of that, when I started to read comic books, it was very much, in addition to that, I loved the, the books themselves and the stories and the characters and all that. It was also, I always had this strong sense that I was sharing in um, my father's own experience of childhood, growing up in Brooklyn in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And so there was a kind of continuum between his childhood and my childhood, which was then even more strongly reinforced because the comics I was reading in the, in the early 70s, especially those that were published by DC Comics, were heavily uh, padded with reprints. So they would have these 80-page comics and 100-page comics, and only the first story, if that, would be new, and the whole rest of the book would all be all this stuff from the vault. So I was actually literally reading the same comics that my father had grown up reading. Mm -hmm. So this, it was a very, it always felt like a passageway into the world of New York in the 30s and 40s, and the, you know, the stories my father told me about growing up in Brooklyn and so on. So I think, that time has been always been very vivid to me. It's always been very present to me in my imagination. And I kind of, I always had this longing to see it for myself and experience it for myself and to wish I could have gone to the 1939 New York World's Fair or, um, you know, um, played the games that in the street that my kid, my dad remember playing when he was a kid. Um, and eventually that longing to see that world for myself got strong enough that I felt like I'd like to try to set a book there. Um, Did you see the New York of that mid-century period when you were writing Cavalier and Clay? I mean, was it clear in your mind, the images of it? And so forth? Yeah, I mean, I think I always had this, you know, maybe mistaken, but strong sense of what it was like through my father's memories and recollections and then those getting reinforced by popular media from the time, whether movies and um, uh, radio programs, reading comics, hearing other people's stories, I, and reading, as I got older, the history of the period in the Second World War and the Roosevelt years and um, the Truman years and all of that stuff just um, was always of great interest to me. And I always felt like I, I was this close, you know, to being able to see it for myself. And, and just to push me over that last barrier, uh, I needed to write a book that would be set then. Because there were all those battles going on about comic books supposedly being bad for children's right. imaginations. Right. They were toxic. There were House of, uh, right. House of Representatives committees on this. Right. Now parents are so grateful their kids are reading anything, right? <laughs> like, he read a cereal box. Um, Plus, we, we have graphic fiction have now. We have, we, have, yeah, the, we have Proust and Melville and everybody in sure, graphic books. Sure, and, and Mouse won the Pulitzer for yeah. a special Pulitzer. Um, uh, so, yeah, things have changed. Um, comics have gained at least some measure of respectability, uh, and it took a very long time, and it was through a lot of um, great hard work on the part of people starting back with Will Eisner in the 40s and coming forward um, up to the present, people like Chris Ware and Dan Cloud and so on. Um, it's a really exciting world, the world of comics. You still read them? Yeah, I do. My yeah. kids all read them. We, you know, we go to the our comic book shop in Berkeley, Comic Relief. Um, maybe not every Wednesday when the new comics come out, but yeah, at least one Wednesday a month, maybe two. The generation tradition continues. Mm -hmm. You've said about your writing, and, and you spin wonderful stories, and you're a real raconteur, and you build plot, you build suspense, you do all the things that technically... All that cheesy 19th century... <laughs> Foreshadowing and cliffhangers and all that. Yeah, stuff. all those all those tricks of the trade. Mm -hmm. But the but the truth is, because I know you've said this to me and you've said this to other people who've interviewed you, you're much more intoxicated by the research and the language than you are by plotting. In fact, plotting to you is is kind of plotting with two D's, isn't it? Yeah, that it's really hard for me, um, and I don't. It doesn't come at all naturally, um, but it's very important to me to have hopefully propulsive or at least forward moving plot in in my books because that, it's important to me as a reader and i mean that's not to say like I, there's plenty of many of my favorite books of all time don't have a whole lot of plot uh you know i love marcel proust and there's you know except for the big uh pirate battle in the middle of that one book by proust um there's not a whole lot of sword fighting and 
action in Marcel Proust, but uh, you know, it's not what you go to Proust for. And Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy doesn't have a whole lot of plot. It's kind of meandering. I mean, I, and that's one of my favorite books. So it's not a requirement, but generally speaking, I like a story as a reader that moves forward with a sense of what's going to happen next, even if it's just what's going to happen when I open the refrigerator. Um, so I try to get some of that into my work, and it is very important to me, but it doesn't come naturally. Um, and I struggle with it probably more than any other aspect of writing. When you were writing Cavalier and Clay, um, there's so much that opens up about the golem and magic and the Holocaust and comic books and love, <coughs> romance and war. And I was reminded of another book that has adventures in it, The Adventures of Augie Marge mm -hmm. by Sal Bellow. Mm -hmm. It's episodic and it's a buildings, what we call a buildings woman going into young men and their initiation and awareness of the world. But there's also that sense of, I remember Bellow describing his pores just opening up mm -hmm. when he wrote Augie March. Mm -hmm. Does that sensation resonate for you, that your pores just opened up with all this? Because it's such a wide canvas. Um, well, I mean, speaking of that book in particular, the, what was really important to me, and I, I read that book while I was writing The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, and the title, my title is, you know, kind of a, a play on and an allusion to the title, The Adventures of Augie March. And I was, so I was very aware of that book, and I read it one and a half times while I was writing Cavalier and Clay. And I mean, for me, the thing that was most important about that book was the voice, um, especially of the first 200 pages. That, that book kind of loses its way for me, and it goes off to New, to New Mexico. 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 And there's a hawk. Eagles. And, and, yeah, yeah that, that whole. That, I, he lost me, but the initial opening sort of the urban experience as presented through the incredible linguistic chops of a writer like Bello with the characters and the caricatures of these uh, Chicago Jews of this particular period is just, was very, it was a clue for me in how to approach, not just how to write my book, but how, even more than that, how my characters, especially my, Sam Clay, might think of himself. And, 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 and I, I always felt like if Sammy Clay, the writer Sam Clay wanted to be, would probably be somebody like Saul Bellow. And so that was a clue for me uh, in trying to imagine what Sammy was like. As long as we're talking about Chicago just for a moment and novels with the title Adventure in them, Hemingway, from Chicago uh -huh. originally, said that all literature goes back to Huckleberry Finn. And I think what he meant by mm -hmm. that, the adventures of Huckleberry right. Finn, what he meant by that was the voice, the, the kind of vernacular and right. spoken English that right. really intoxicates you in some ways, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's interesting for me as a reader and what I try to, um, I think part of what I try to do when I'm writing sentences for the, in most of my work is to try to get that, to, to try to create a language that can encompass both everyday vernacular slang, um, spoken language as it exists now, and a more literary register with lots of imagery. And, and I've always been interested in writers that seem to sort of combine almost effortlessly those kind of strands. And you find that in the Bello book and a, and a lot of Bello. And, um, you know, in a, like Raymond Chandler, one of the reasons I've always loved Chandler is because he has that perfect, often perfect blending of tough guy, urban slang, and a lot of which he made up, I think, and mm -hmm. uh, and then the more more polished, uh, elevated diction and lots of similes, and uh, you know the way that he just combines into one sentence, kind of both poles of of language, he was a lover of, Chandler was a lover of poetry, and he also, you know, read Dashiell Hammett, and he, he kind of brought those two things together, and, and that makes those sentences of Chandler's feel really charged to me. And I think, you know, uh, literary language benefits from being brought into close proximity with spoken everyday language and slang, um, and, and vice versa. I think slang and spoken language can do really unexpected things when they're sort of harnessed to a more literary engine. How significant in your work is that whole sense of what Philip Roth would call 
Jewishness, I mean, as opposed to Judaism. Is that what he calls it? Well, it's not his word originally. How did he come up with that? <laughs> yeah, he didn't come up with it, no, but he makes a distinction between the religion, Judaism, uh -huh. and the identity, Jewishness. Right. And right. there's a lot of Jewishness in Cavalier and Clay, right. and there's a lot of search for Jewish identity, which may or may not be distinct from American identity. How do you see that? Um, well, that's a kind of complicated question, and I'm not sure I have a really um, that informed or enlightened of, a, of an answer for it. But I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that the Jewish story, the, 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 the story of Jews and their descendants in this country is an American story, is a, is a, you know, a quintessentially American story. Um, and there are many respects in which the, the American story, the story of this country, is, is a Jewish story in many ways. And just whether from the way that so many of the pilgrims and the founding fathers' ideas were founded in the Old Testament. And um, I was just reading this great Robert Alter. Bob Alter has a new book called Pen of Iron. It's yeah. all about um, the, the King James Bible in American literature, the, the shadow of the King James Bible. And, and um, you know, they're, they're, they're so caught up. Those two narratives are so completely caught up with each other um, that I don't think they can be separated or extricated. And certainly, I wouldn't want to try to do that. And then I, felt, I feel like in my work, I feed off that, um, the way that those narratives are so wound up with each other and with you know, narratives of many other. It has a lot to do with your narrative drive, though, doesn't it? What does? Jewish identity, American uh, well, identity? Well, I get a lot of uh, uh, mileage out of it and plot ideas and you know, story ideas and, and characters and people I've known. And you know, a lot of the people I've known best in my life have not incidentally been Jews. And um, so if I'm just looking to create a quick, plausible, believable, credibly portrayed character, uh, and, you know, I feel a certain sense of urgency because I need to keep this scene moving or whatever it might be. You know, I'll probably reach into my, my, my Jew bag before I would go <laughs> reaching into some other bag, you know, where I might not, might be on shakier ground. If, I, if my story was set in New Mexico in, in the 1730s, you know, I probably couldn't go for, for, for my Uncle Jack as a character model so readily. But, uh, but in many contexts, you know, that's my comfort zone and that's where I might turn first when I'm just looking for, for bits and pieces that I can sell plausibly as real people. How comfortable story. are you with um, creating women characters? I think Rose is a great character, for example. Thank you. Yeah. She was kind of my, well, I don't know. I think I, I've got, I would like to think I've gotten better with each book, starting with Wonder Boys and then Rosa in Cavalier and Clay, and um, my favorite of all my female characters so far is um, Bina in the Yiddish Policeman's Union. Um, you know, I've, I feel like I've gotten a little more comfortable and hopefully I've done a little bit of a better job, but it, it is still weirdly not as easy for me or not as comfortable up until this moment. And actually, the novel I'm working on right now has two female char main characters and two male main characters. And of the four of them, I'm having the easiest time with one of the two female characters. And she's coming to me quite readily. That, maybe that's a bad thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, usually, my, my best female characters, Bina, Rosa, even Sarah Gaskell in Wonder Boys, are all sort of reflections of or versions of my wife, I yell it. And, you know, um, I've known Ayelet for 18 years now, and almost 18 years, and so I've gotten to know her better and better. Um, and, uh, you know, just been able to draw more and more freely on all kinds of aspects of her. She's a very complicated person, but all kinds of useful things um, <laughs> for creating female characters. And I, so I think it's partly the reason I've gotten better, is just because I've, been, I've had, you know, been able to observe up close one extremely interesting woman for a very long period of time. She's given you a lot of women characters from the South. Many, yes. many. And the <laughs> crazy that my favorite thing, though, is with the Yiddish Policeman's Union. Um, uh, I mean, I really, I drew all kinds of stuff right from life, from my yeah, like physical details and all kinds of things. Um, and what I hope is a very appealing 
um, way and it made an appealing character. And then after the book started to come out, someone came up to her and said, oh, I was so touched by that loving portrait uh, Michael drew of you in the book. And I was like, what? <laughs> like she, hadn't, she had read the book maybe nine times. She had never noticed, it had never occurred to her that the character was based on her. So I don't know what, the, I don't know what that means. Either I did a terrible job or she's not very self-aware or <laughs> I don't know. But, so. but I think maybe she's so, she thinks of herself in such a negative light that to see someone portrayed so positively just couldn't possibly be her. You're, you're saying that your characters do come from your life and from composites and memory and so forth, but I'm struck by often how rounded the characters are. You know, Ian Forster makes this distinction in aspects of the novel mm -hmm. between flat characters mm -hmm. and round characters, mm -hmm. and he says creating round characters is the challenge for the novelist. Right. I mean, what do you do in terms of making sure that your characters aren't just single-dimensional cardboard characters? Well, it's... If I remember my Forster correctly, and, and I think there's a certain amount of truth in this, I mean, characters who feel round are often, are, are very frequently... The, not the most appealing characters in a given book. And, and frequently, the characters you enjoy the most as a reader, the characters you love the most, the characters who sort of stick with you and even become maybe proverbial characters that everybody knows, are very often the flatter characters. Um, and those tend to be characters who have one or two overreaching personality traits or things that they want. They just want one thing and they go about getting it, or they have one, one or two flaws. You know, like Jane Austen is such a master with the, the mother in, um, is it in Mansfield Park with the pugs? And she's always talking about her pugs, and she's worrying about her pugs. And you, know, you just give somebody some pugs, you're set. <laughs> like, that's it. You know, I mean, if you have the wit and the irony of Jane Austen, it, it's, it's helpful too. But, um, you know, that's a flat character is often a character I think you remember with more affection in retrospect and maybe even read with more pleasure. But the rounded characters um, are often the more tragic characters. I don't think a flat character can be a tragic character. And they tend to be people like, they tend to be more like all of us in that they um, have have uh, bad and good in them. They have conflicting impulses. They, they, they might do something, you know, uh, once that is kind and charitable and then turn around and do something incredibly cruel and destructive mm -hmm. um, like all of us. Um, and it's not, I don't know if it's so much that it's hard to write, harder to write a round character. I think it might be harder to write a really wonderful flat character in a sense because you do often run the risk of cliche and, and um, just kind of running the joke into the the gag into the ground, you know, with a flat character, and that can be, that can be deadly for a book. But it's, it's just that um, you have to be careful with real people, putting real people with round characters in your book, because um, particularly if you're trying to tell a story, a plot with a plot, there's always this tension, at least in my experience, between what the plot wants and needs and what the character wants and needs. And those, and they're, they're, it's like a, the more power, the more sway you give to plot, the more you let plot dictate what, what the plot book is about. Plot creates character then, yeah. It, it, it flattens your, it doesn't just flatten your characters out, it turns them into puppets, into tools. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a lot of commercial fiction, this, uh, your average airplane book, you pick it up, it's, one character is completely indistinguishable from the others. They don't need to be much more than whatever their role in the plot is. Um, on the other hand, if you start to really lavish a lot of time and attention in creating this fully imagined, realized human being with conflicting impulses, um, who behaves in contradictory ways and does one thing one day, like I said, and another the other day, that makes it tough to plot. You know, a plot kind of requires people to do what they would do in a given moment. And, and if your character could go any way of any one of three or four different ways at a given moment, because that's how people are. Well, sometimes uh, there's, there's this phenomenon of what Henry James called the ficelle. You have a character just to move the plot forward right. and doesn't fit any other role in the story other right. than to right. move it I mean, no, and those characters, God love them. They're the greatest. <laughs> you know, and I definitely have a tendency to, I mean, I think almost all of my favorite characters in my books are the more minor 
characters. Um, they're just more fun to write. Like a character in, like in Cavalier and Clay, George Deasy, the editor. You know, and, and, and even, with, even with flat characters, even with a character like George Deasy, I mean, he started out as flat in my imagination. And, and it flat it sounds like a pejorative word, but it, I don't think it has any pejorative connotations at all. It just means, oh, he, he does one thing well, let's say. So George Deasy was, was a bastard. That was his job. He's just, he's mean, he's, you know, he, he's derisive, he's, he's cool, he puts people down, he, 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 he hates everyone, including himself, and he takes his, his, his bitterness out on everyone around him. And, and, and I was thinking, I had read a lot of histories of comics, and there were these two very well-known editors um, uh, uh, during the Golden Age and into, well into the 60s um, who were, it just, as I read these accounts, these, these stories of what jerks they were and how mean they were and how cruel and how domineering and irritable and all that. So that I had these two different real life guys. I thought, well, that must be, must come with the territory. So I'm going to make my guy, I have a create an editor, I'll make him a big jerk like these big jerks were. And that was all I started with. But even with George Deasy, not, I mean, not only was he fun, he was really well educated. He, I think he went to Columbia, so he could speak well. He was polished. He was refined, and and um, uh, so he. It's really fun to write. You know, as, as if you know the movie um, uh, All About Eve. You know, just a character like Addison Dewitt, who's mean and literate. You know, it's like such a wonderful combination. He always has the best lines. He, this, you know, these kind of characters excite you. Obviously. Yeah, this is, yeah. that's fun. You know, yeah. it's like to have someone who's always going to have the put down, just this perfect put down ready, you know, in a way that I, I, I certainly can never manage in real life. That's really fun. But, but by the end of the book, even George Deasy, you know, he has his little moments where uh, ultimately I have a hard time. I guess I get, I get a certain amount of affection for a character. I have a hard time letting them just stay flat. And every so often, certain of them at least start to feel like they want to have their moment. And George Deasy has a couple of small moments in the book where he actually reveals that he, he does care, that he is kind somewhere deep down inside of it, even though he would never admit it to himself or anybody else. And, he, and at the very end of the book, he, he stands up. He kind of backs Sam and Clay up in a way. He, he, he intrudes in this way that is... Um, very helpful to Sammy, even though he does it in a really sour, nasty, bitter um, way. It still means a lot to Sammy. So. Well, did that surprise you? Uh, do, do characters surprise you sometimes like that? Yeah, but I think as a as a viewer of 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 art, as a reader of art, as a consumer of stories, I always respond. The thing I get the most choked up about, if I'm watching a movie or that's going to get me choked up. Uh, or reading a book and it gets me choked up. It's almost always uh, a moment where of uh, unexpected kindness, where someone who's not nice mm -hmm. and it does something kind without thereby becoming nice. You getting a little far clumped right now talking What's about that? You? Yeah, I'm <laughs> just kind of moved just at the very yeah. thought of my own um, eloquence. Um, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's poignant to you, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it's just those that always catches me by surprise, and I think it's just because that is. It's, it is, there's kind of, there's this gratuitous, um, these gratuitous gestures that, that I guess maybe I've experienced them a few times in my life, but where someone is much nicer than they need to be, um, much nicer than the situation calls for, and that their past behavior would indicate that they were capable of doing, you know, and, and you suddenly realize, you're forced to realize, like, I've misjudged, not only have I misjudged this person, but I've mis, that, that just means if I misjudge this person, then it, everything I thought was true was wrong. And it calls everything into question in a way and it makes you realize, you know, that you, you sort of go through life on the surface of things, making assumptions about people and, and generally they don't challenge those assumptions. Um, but when they do, um, for good or for ill, I think those are inherently kind of moving and dramatic moments. And people can definitely surprise you in the other way too. Did you find pleasure in, you know, having the Nazis beaten up sort of like Quentin Tarantino? Um, <laughs> Well, you know, unfortunately... Not on that scale. Yeah, I mean, they only yeah. get beaten up in, a pic, you know, in, the, in pictures and comic books. Um, yeah. I didn't get to actually, um, you know... I, it was double... It was a kind of double vicariousness in the sense that I was experiencing 
vicariously the vicarious pleasure that Joe Cavalier was yeah. getting in drawing the but picture. It's, it's, it's vicarious, but it's punching. palpable. Yeah. I could I could see the appeal, and I could see the appeal in a movie like Pulp, in in uh, in the Tarantino movie too, um, uh, Inglourious, Inglourious Bastards. Bastards. Um, but I didn't. I mean, I think for me, what was and I'm a huge Quentin Tarantino fan, and some of his movies are really important to me, like Jackie Brown and and Pulp Fiction, but I really didn't like Inglourious Bastards, and, and, and the reason I didn't like it was partly because I was disappointed that it wasn't more of a war movie that I had been imagining, like Kelly's Heroes or The Guns of Navarone. I thought he was, it was gonna be his version of that kind of a movie, and it's really not, so that's not his fault, but I also felt that um, I had to acknowledge for myself, my character, Joe Cavalier, had to acknowledge I had to acknowledge, and I tried to acknowledge in the book, that it is all, it's, it's, it's just make-believe, it's wish fulfillment, and it's, it is satisfying to imagine, you know, punching Hitler, or traveling back in time and strangling him in his cradle, or, or all the different kinds of fantasies people have had about it over the years, but, but it is also painful to imagine that, because you know it's, not true, and it didn't happen, and, and, the, and the pain that is inherent in those kind of wishful fantasies of revenge and, and of, of um, you know, sort of retrospective um, uh, justice being served on people that were not adequately punished for their crimes, um, it is satisfying. It does fulfill some kind of primitive longing you have, but it's incredibly painful and demoralizing and disappointing at the same time because it is impossible. And so are superheroes good for kids then, do you think? Are superheroes good for kids? Well, that's a separate thing. I mean, yeah, I think anything that helps people, that expands people's imaginations and, and ex, um, exposes them to, um, you know, storytelling and um, that sort of inherent potential that everybody has, which I think is an important part of the superhero idea, the idea that, you know, and any one of us might be the secret identity of something, somebody really powerful and special and um, unique. Uh, you know, I think that's a really useful, helpful um, narrative to cling to when you're a kid, especially if you're a kid that, whose life um, may not be sending him the same message that he's or she's useful. And but then important. you have to face those disappointments and adversities and tragedies that you just alluded to. Right, but kids are smart. Um, they, and they do face them, you know? And that's what I'm talking about, I guess, is that, that with, with Inglorious Bastards, I didn't feel like that movie faced that. It didn't acknowledge the, 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 the pain that comes when you put the towel around your neck and jump off the garage and break your leg instead of flying, you know? Um, and yes, yeah, so it can be disappointing. Yes, you do have to face the fact that you're never going to be um, Spider-Man or whatever it might be, but I think that's good. How mindful are you and were you in writing Cavalier and Clay? I mean, there's, um, there's the attempt by um, those in the comic book industry to exploit the talent of your characters and their... Uh -huh the whole political world of fascism as it was rising at that time, there are certainly things that you key in on that make us aware of the historicity and aware of poli political realities. And I guess it's no secret that you're very political minded and you and your wife are both quite active mm -hmm. uh, in, in politics and have been in social causes and social justice. How important is it to infuse that into the narrative or do you simply say that's off, out of bounds? Well, I'm not at all comfortable. I, my, pol my politics are not very... Uh, no sermons? They're not very interesting to me. I mean, my, my own... I'm more interested in other people's politics than my own, and my own are not very interesting to me. Um, and I don't... They don't provide me with a whole lot of ideas for stories, or I never turn to my political ideas or beliefs for almost anything when it comes to when it's when I sit down in the chair and I'm starting to write tell, try to tell a story um, but they're there and they're real and they're strong and I know they're there and I just sort of trust that they will help inform and shape the kind of stories that I'm interested in telling 
but that's enough for me. And I mean, it really, it's the same way with almost every kind of thematic aspect of writing. Um, uh, you, you know, when I was writing Cavalier and Clay, it took me a while, a long time, a couple of years maybe, and a lot of pages before I started to realize that escape was a theme of the book, you know, uh, maybe 18 months before I realized why. Wow, I've got like five or six references to Houdini, and comic books were criticized for being escapist so literature. How Joe gets here to the United uh, States? Yeah, right, and I had him escaping from, from Prague, and so I had these, you know, elements that I had never looked at. I never, I had never tried to hook them up or noticed that they seemed to be, you know, pieces of a of some kind of thematic whole. They were just there. And um, then at some point, I guess it was when it came time for me to, I had this, these characters who needed to create a superhero, and I had them create a kind of, at first, this sort of more generic kind of superhero. And I never liked his name or his powers. Or I never settled on a name I liked, and I couldn't figure out what the character's powers would be. And eventually I got to a point where I said to myself, you know, I, ha I have to figure this out. I got to come, like, who is the character? What does he do? What is his name? What, what are his powers? What's his origin story? I, it's time has come for me to figure all this stuff out. Um, is so, that like doing a genealogy almost and going cause and effect and back? Well, I did uh, end up writing an origin story and a full, you know, full account of his origins and, um, you know, all kinds of supplementary materials like that. But uh, I just, what I decided to do, almost like out of a principle of economy, was... Um, have whatever character he was, whatever his name was, whatever his powers were, have it fit. Like, have it actually, well, what could I, what could his powers be that would have something to do with my characters and their lives and what they've been through and what they um, want and need and desire? And th it was at that point, that's when, you know, you say, okay, what am I writing about here? Like, what is this book about? What are my themes? And at that point, I noticed, hey, I've got all this escape, I've got this, all the things I mentioned. Um, so maybe he should be an escape artist, and maybe his name should have something to do with locks or keys or, or escape in some way or another. And, you know, so at that point, theme, I do give my attention to thematic concerns in the way that I might to a political message or something at some stage of the game when I need it, when it's, mm -hmm. when it, when it's gonna, but only when it's gonna help me solve plot problems or character problems or, or something like that. It's, it's, a it's also self-reflexive of the writing process, isn't it? I mean, you have to escape when you're writing fiction, you have to go into an altered state, and then you have to work out the plot in a way that gets you through. Yeah, the... and you're trapped for sure. I mean, every book feels like a trap, definitely. Yeah. Like every single time. And yes, I mean, I have, I like the challenge of it and the work of it um, can be very rewarding and satisfying on a daily basis, but um, you know, right now I've been working on this book I'm working on now for a couple of years, and I, and I definitely, I just, there's always a part of me that wishes I was done, that wants it to be over, that I want to do other things, I feel stuck, I want to move on, and, and then, you know, you have that sense of like, no, I got to keep going, I got to stick with it, and, and, and uh, you know, that sense of liberation that you get is very real when you've finished a book and it's done and you turn it in and, and you realize you don't have to do that ever again. Um, you know, it's, do you it's think you'll ever go feeling. back to these characters? It's well, I have gone back to them a little ways over the years. Yeah, I've, done a, I've written a few little um, sort of afterthought. I was pieces. thinking more of a novel, though. Yeah. Another whole novel? I, I, I thought about it. I mean, I thought about there was this period in comic book history was known as the Golden Age, the, the, from the creation of Superman in 1938 until... Um, about 1954. And so there is a Silver Age as well, which began, let's say, like 1960, 61, and lasted through the 60s. Um, and then there's, you know, some people have the Bronze Age, which is like the 70s. But so there, there could be other books sort of carrying the history of comic books forward, and, and I might be able to follow these characters or their descendants or something through that next period in comics history, and I've thought about it. And if I am going to do it, I probably should at least start interviewing people who were around then in the late 60s and early 70s, because people have a way of dying 
I've noticed. And when I started on this Cavalier and Clay, almost all of the most important artists and writers of the time were still alive, and I could only get to a few of them. You got to Jack Kirby, didn't you? No, he died just before I started working on the oh, book. Oh, I thought you, but to... Uh, Stan Lee. To Will Eisner. Uh, Will Eisner, yeah. Gil Kane, a few of the other guys. Um, but they were all there, and, you know, if I were better connected at that time, I probably would have been able to get to more of them than I did. Um, but, and now there's almost none, they're almost all gone. Almost all of the great originators have died. Um, Joe Kubert is still left. I just saw him at, a, at WonderCon in the city last month. Um, but so, you know, the guys who were in their 20s and 30s and the 70s are still hale and hearty, and I should probably start talking to them now. Yeah. I, I still can. We should also probably start talking to the audience because okay. we've uh, come to that point in this evening's discussion where we're going to open things up and give you an opportunity to ask a question or make a comment Here if come you prefer. The questions. Pardon? I say, here come the questions. Uh, anyway. or, else, or else it's knives to throw. Actually, they're wonderful questions. Uh, but we have a number of questions about your personal life, Michael. All right. Uh, my favorite kind. Uh, Are they hostile questions about my No. Oh, they're curious, though. Um, people want to know about how it works, knowing that you are two novelists working together in your household with a zillion children. And how do you manage that? And uh, how does having those children affect what you write? Um, well, it, they, have a, they have a really deleterious effect. Um, <laughs> and uh, I probably, I know I would get a lot more writing done, um, you know, if I didn't have so many children. But, um, but That's okay. <laughs> They're all right. Um, and I'm more fond of them than I am of my books, generally speaking, it, it, <laughs> on average. Um, so, uh, but you know, it, it's tough. It's, you know, we're, we're both disciplined and have good work habits. Um, I had good work habits instilled in me when I was in graduate school at UC Irvine uh, by living with a former Marin County resident, Louis B. Jones, really great novelist, um, who was my housemate and um, 10 years older than I am and was and had already acquired good work habits and just living in the same house with him and having to endure the shame of hearing him get up every morning and, and go to work at you know 6 a.m. and, and um, uh, was more than I could bear, <laughs> and so I started working myself because I was embarrassing um, not to. So I got in the habit of writing every day, um, and so then when I yell it, when I met I yell it, she was not writing; she was practicing as a criminal defense lawyer, or she was clerking for a judge and then became a criminal defense lawyer. And um, but when she she just the only writer she ever knew was me, and she saw me having good work habits. So when she started writing. She just didn't have any idea that wasn't expected of it. You know, that, that, that wasn't, everybody wasn't like that. So, you know, we, we keep each other honest. We, we help also um, enable each other to get our work done. So I try to make it easier for her whenever I can. She tries to make it easier for me. We try to guard each other's time and the calendar. And, and uh, I'm going off to the McDowell Colony um, very shortly, and that means I'm leaving her alone to take care of the kids, and she, I do the same for her so she can go away and work. And, um, you know, so we, we try to, to help um, and support each other. So in a way, actually, having two of us is maybe easier than it might be in a household where just one person is a writer, because it sometimes can be hard to look at what a writer is doing and actually think of it as work. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really seem that hard. Um, and it's a lot easier than a lot of other jobs, um, you know, um, that I could think of. So, you know, it, it, at least when your partner is a writer as well, they're not going to have that sort of jaundiced view of you sitting with your feet up, um, you know, reading someone's biography and claiming that you're working. Because um, we, you know, I've been there, I know that, that 
that that sometimes that's part of the, it is part of the job. So, I mean, there's that aspect to it. Um, we also neglect our children a lot, and um, I think that's very helpful <laughs> technique, and it's good for the children too. <laughs> that leads right into the next question. This person wants to know if you think that writers are just born with talent that all they have to do is develop, or whether uh, talent is something that is developed just from hard work? Um, well, I think, ha being, I think you are born with certain traits that might predispose you to have an easier time of it when you decide to start writing, um, or might predispose you to want to take up writing in the first place. Um, I think it's helpful if you like being alone. Um, if I think it's helpful if you are um, so uncomfortably shy that you stand in the corner and watch things um, <laughs> happening, and then you're sort of, because you are actually participating and in the center of the room having a good time, you start to notice things um, and pay attention to things um, that are going on. Um, you know, I think you could have it ear for language um, that you're born with, or maybe a gift for language, or to be, um, uh, have a gift for storytelling, for narrative. Um, you know, that's a gift I wish I had been born with. <laughs> I had to work at that, you know, and, and I work at it every single day. That aspect of the job doesn't come as easily for me as hearing the words that I'm going to use to describe what I'm trying to write about, which that, I don't, that just, I mean, that is a gift in this most elemental sense of the word that I have no idea where it came from or what. Or I don't have anything to do with it. It just, that just comes. The words, the language just come. Um, but what happens next or what to do next, I think there are writers, there are people who are just kind of innate, inherent storytellers. Um, so there are, there's a pretty big skill set, and you might be born with one or two or many of those elements and have to really work hard to develop the other ones. I need to just put a footnote in here because um, I, was at an, I was at an event, pardon? Oh, I thought I heard. Uh, no, I was at an event one night uh, a number of years ago uh, having a discussion about uh, Buddhism and Judaism with a rabbi that some people may remember named Alan Liu who mm -hmm. uh, passed away. Oh, did he? I didn't hear that. Yeah, he passed away a couple years ago. and. Your mother came up to me, uh -huh. and after it was over, because I had mentioned oh, this Abraham. going to be embarrassing. I had mentioned Abraham Khan, uh -huh. who had been the editor of the Forward, and right. she let me know first that she was related to Abraham yes. Khan, and then she said, "I'm Michael Chabon's mother." And I thought, well, you know, there is some DNA there. I mean, um, <laughs> there might be. It's kind of a. I mean, he was my Abraham. He was the Khan. editor of the Forward. He the was Yiddish, the editor the of, the, of the Forward, the Yiddish newspaper, is still in existence today. I think it's weekly in Yiddish now, not daily and uh, weekly in English as well. Uh, he was a novelist. He wrote a novel called The um, Rise of David Levinsky. Which was kind of the, the archetypical Jewish-American novel, right? The Rise of David Levinsky. Right. Um, he was my mother's father's grandfather's nephew or something like that. I don't know. Anyway. I thought it was less remote. Fairly, fairly remote connection, but he was always held, certainly held up to me as a you know, as a kid, as you know, that this is a possibility. This is a real, this is a thing. Not only do people do this for a living, but you are related to this great man who did this for a living. You know, I, and I, I think that definitely, if for in, in a way, a part of the culture of my family, that being a writer, becoming a writer, was a, was a real possibility, a respectable possibility. And here's this man that, you know, that we all revered, that all, almost all, you know, Ashkenazic Jews revered or or it's certainly respected, and, and so, you know, I think that, that if I was sort of looking around thinking, what do I want to do with myself, um, you know, I had this role model within the family of somebody that had, had done it and, you know, done pretty well for himself. Uh, there is a question about your mother here, um, <laughs> because you mentioned your father in pushing comic books. Right. Uh, and this person wants to know, did your mother approve of the comic books? And my, how my, did she feel? My mother didn't approve or disapprove. Um, she had absolutely no interest in them whatsoever. And so she, she, I mean, I can remember her being mildly impressed when I put them in plastic bags. 
but only because it was such an, um, an unprecedented display of tidiness on my part. You know, like, <laughs> like for that, you'll put things away. Like, okay, at least I know you're capable of it. Um, but beyond that, I mean, she didn't ever look at them or, you know, I mean, I read, I wasn't all I read, and I read a lot, and I love to read um, all kinds of stuff, and a lot of what I read was stuff she recommended to me, stuff books she had lived, loved as a, as a girl. Um, you know, she took a great interest in my reading life um, and was very involved in, you know, taking me to the library and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when it came to comics, she just, I mean, they were just, like the way your your kid's music um, might just sound like noise to you, you know, and like you don't, it's just all the same and you don't distinguish among, um, you know, Rihanna or, well, I can't even, I won't embarrass myself, I don't even know, because <laughs> um, I'm very fortunate and my, my kids um, have adopted my taste in music, at least in my presence, so. Um, but uh, it was like that for her, it was just, it just, it didn't, matter to her at all. But she didn't hate them either. She didn't try to take them away from me or... or Some or, of them were pretty scary. Some of those horror comics, you remember? Well, they had cleaned them up by the time... Well, those, see, I'm older than you Those are, things but, were, yeah. they were... That's what the whole flap was about. In 1954 yeah. was this really grotesque um, elements that had crept into uh, comics um, and were being read by kids. And, and, you know, when I was reading, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, there was there were more mature themes beginning to emerge in comics of things like drug abuse and racial um, uh, uh, discrimination and that kind of stuff, but not sex and not violence, not yet. Now it's very different and all that stuff yeah. has come now roaring it's, back. It's but. like everything else, but the, the horror comics from my era when the I was a young boy. The EC comics, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, they were, they were pretty... Yeah, pretty, they, they, were, they, they went were over gruesome. the line. They went over the line a few times. And did you read classic comics? I, you know, I didn't. My dad loved them and used to tell me about them, but... Um, they had the the lettering in the balloons was printed, yeah, not hand lettered, That's and right. I, I didn't like that. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I like the hand lettering, and whenever I read comics that had printed balloons, that always put me off for some reason. It made the people sound like they were robots. Did you send away for sea monkeys or um... sea monkeys? Yes, I did send away for sea monkeys. Yeah, for sure. What a colossal disappointment that was. Talk about. You know, salutary disappointment. Um, that was, I, I, and I can just remember my dad just, like, he must have known what was coming. He was just sort of watching the whole experience from the moment I said I was ordering them until they arrived. And, you know, and uh, for those of you who don't know, sea monkeys were depicted as these, this wonderful, fabulous kingdom of these pink creatures with little antennas and they had families and castles and, and you could send away on the back of the comic and they would come in the mail and you just added water and you'd have these, these wonderful sentient um, playmates. Like, and like it never occurred to me that like, well, if these things are real, like why don't I ever see any anywhere? Like they're not on TV. They would have their own show, certainly. Um, and then uh, what you got was a box of like freeze dried or somehow dehydrated brine shrimp. <laughs> like when, when, and they, in fact, it, yeah. when you added water, they did reanimate. I don't know. That is actually kind of awesome now that I think about it. <laughs> um, but they didn't have cars or. or <laughs> when I was, I, I must tell you, when I was eight years old, I was starting to collect stamps and there was a comic, there was DC comic books. Mm -hmm. They advertised the assortment. The, no, no, no. They have, you know, you can get assorted stamps, yeah. but these were stamps from different planets. Wow. Just, you know, wow. You could get stamps from Jupiter and Saturn. Did you order them? Yeah, and, yeah. and even Pluto. <laughs> even Pluto. That's kind of a cool, that's a cool idea. I like that. I, didn't, I don't remember those. I remember the, the um, sub, the like life-size submarine model, and I remember, um, the, of course, the Charles Atlas physical fitness things and the jokes, the onion gum and the black soap and the, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a question about your research. Uh, and uh, a couple of people want to know, did you spend a lot of time in the Empire State Building or at Flushing Meadows? And how about Prague? Did you have to go to Prague for um, a while? Well, actually, I, I went to Prague before I ever thought about writing the book. And I only spent one week there. Um, 
but it made a very strong, very vivid impression on me. And I, um, you know, so it was, and, and I started writing the book in 94, so two years later. So still very fresh in my mind. And, and um, you know, I was sort of haunted by, uh, Prague has this, um, you know, it had, a, it had a Jewish, it wasn't really a ghetto. At first it was just a, district or neighborhood where the Jews lived, and then it was turned into a ghetto, and it was preserved um, by the Nazis. They intended to um, create a museum of an extinct race there and have this, like, so, so nothing, it, nothing befell it, and it's all still there, but it, there are no Jews, and so I had this experience of, of not only being in this, this place that was haunted by the Holocaust, but that it was also haunted by these Jewish ghosts that were just omnipresent, which were the image of Kafka. Um, I don't know if it's still like this, because I haven't been back, but in 1992, Kafka was everywhere on t-shirts and tote bags and mugs and, and the golem, mm -hmm. the golem of Prague. And these two figures that were, that were so ubiquitous that were used as almost like logos for the city came out of this culture that was completely destroyed and, and, and is gone. And um, so that made this really powerful impression on me, and then, and then, you know, I'd always been interested in the golem. Um, when it came time for me to have a Czech Jew try to create a superhero never having seen a comic book before, the golem came to him very naturally. It came to me very naturally, and then that is what led that into the book. Um, and I called on my memories of having been in Prague, but I ended up just doing pure research, reading books, going to the library, um, tracking things down in magazines, the internet, the World Wide Web was still a gleam in, in <laughs> you know, Sergey Brin's eye at the time. Um, but, um, uh, you know, research is not, it's an important part of almost every book I've written, whether it's a historically based book like this one or some of my others, or whether it's set in the present day. Uh, when I wrote my novel Wonder Boys, which was set what was then the present day in 19, early 1990s, um, uh, you know, I had this character, James Lear, in that book who's obsessed with Hollywood movies of the, cl of the classic period. And I knew something about Hollywood movies, but I didn't know everything about Hollywood movies the way James Lear does. And so I had to do a lot of research to be able to pass myself off as James Lear, or to pass James Lear off as James Lear. Um, you know, I had to do a lot of research um, uh, for the book I'm writing now is set in the present day. And it's you know leading me to do all kinds of reading and research and webs web stuff. I mean, the research is pleasurable. I love doing research. In fact, it's often more pleasurable than the writing, which is very <laughs> dangerous. Um, but you have to you have to find that balance because you r research is incredibly it's important because you're trying first of all you're trying to fool the reader, trick the reader into believing that what you're saying really happened really did happen. You have to buttress your lie with facts. Every great liar, you know, when you're holding up that piece of yellow cake, um, you know, <laughs> you, need to, you need to have like the, 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 the facts that prove your lie. So that's, that's one reason you got to get it right. And when you're writing about a period or a place or a time, whether it's the present or the past that people actually still remember, you know, like in Cavalier and Clay, there are a lot of people still around and there were even more then who remembered it very vividly, and I knew I needed to fool those people. And they, they were there, and I wasn't. So it's very important to do research for that reason. It's very important to do research because you find things in your research that you didn't know that can become incredibly important when you're, when you're writing the story. Michael, um, you once told me something that, that stayed in my, my mind about doing some research and discovering something. I think it may have been about New Orleans that you didn't know about, and suddenly you had to imagine it. And you imagined it, and it became actual reality. You know no, the story I'm talking about? I don't remember in context of New Orleans. A lot of, I've had that experience many times of having, of thinking I made something up, and I, that I did make it up, and then it turns out yeah. it happened, or, or it happens after I made it up, or something like that. I mean, that, that happens all the time. Um, it's a, I don't know what it's a byproduct of um, just maybe getting your facts straight, in a sense. Um, but I found so many things in Cavalier and Clay, the Empire State Building, um, you know, uh, Marvel Comics 
had their offices in the Empire State Building in the 40s. So I thought, well, that was cool. So I'm going to use that because I love the Empire State Building, and that'll be cool to have a set in the sense mm -hmm. in, in the Empire State Building. Then I started doing all this research about the Empire State Building, and I um, found out all these interesting things. And But then just purely by chance, because I went to the library and I was reading through old New Yorker magazines from the period, and um, in the talk of the town and flipping through, and I saw the words Empire State Building, and I start reading this thing, and it's about this researcher. I still remember his name, Dr. Carl McEachran, and he was <laughs> researching um, lightning strikes. And it was just, you know, to talk of the town piece. So it was like this, we, we, we caught up with Dr. Carl McEachran the other day. He was in his crow's nest on top of the Empire State Building getting struck by 50,000 volts of <laughs> lightning. And, you know, and that was like that. I didn't know the Empire State Building gets struck by lightning 450 times every August or whatever it is. You know, I, and, and not only that, but I didn't know that if you went out there in immediate aftermath of a lightning strike, this, you could get ball lightning or that there's St. Elmo's fire kind of effects and stuff up there. And I thought, that's really cool. That's very evocative. I could probably do something with that. And, and then it turned into this incredible, incredibly important moment in the love life of Sammy Clay on top of the Empire State Building. And that was just a chance discovery that came about because I was in the library doing research. So that's very important too. But this terrible thing happens, and it happens with every single book. It's happened to me every time where I'll, I'll think, like, I need, I need a battle. I need for there to have been a battle. If only there'd been a battle on this day in this place, that'd be perfect. I'm going to go see if there was one. I do all the research. I go on the web. I go to the library. There's no battle. There was no <laughs> battle anywhere near this place, anywhere near that time. You know, and, I, and I'll have the thought of, like, oh, too bad. Oh well, I can't do it. And then, I'll, and then I, you know, I, hopefully I remember. Like, wait a minute, this is fiction. Like, I, <laughs> if I say there was a battle in this place on that day, there was a battle. It, it doesn't need to be true. That research doesn't. Research is a great tool. It's very helpful and very useful, but it also can be a, a prison. It can be a trap. Um, and you need to break out. And you need to always remind yourself: this is your world. Um, you're, you're making this stuff up. If you say something is true, it's true as long as you back it up and as long as you buttress this. And then you need to do more, more research, of course. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Michael, thank you for letting us into your world. Oh, absolutely. And Michael Krasny, thank you for thank bringing you, out this thank world. You. It was magnificent. Thank you. Thank you.